friends, I am coming to you here at the start of our service because today's service was already recorded before much of the happenings of this week unfolded. Yet I believe this moment must be spoken to for us in the church. I suspect by now we have all heard and possibly seen the heart-wrenching images of George Floyd being forcibly held down under the knee of a Minneapolis police officer on Monday. George Floyd, a black man, dying under the knee of that officer because a shop owner thought that he had possibly forged a check. The death and violence that plague our black siblings on a daily basis have become in many ways seemingly so commonplace that many of us who are not people of color, many of us who are white hardly even notice, unless of course it makes the national news. Stories of violence and aggression against people who simply are living while black surround us. Specifically stories of profiling and aggression, assault and murder carried out because of race. For every story of Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, there are hundreds more that don't get media attention, that we don't seem to notice. And all too often those that do are whitewashed, are spun in such a way that make the black victim a black perpetrator. That's already happening to Mr. Floyd, attempting to show that he died of natural causes while pressed under the knee of that officer. Folks attempting to justify actions that have no justification. Innocent people all too often harassed, arrested, even killed by people like you and like me because our society teaches that their skin color means that they are criminal, that they are other, that they are lesser than the rest of us white folk. I hesitate truly to say much because I am still an infant on this anti-racism journey. I still have so much to learn, but we cannot, I cannot stay silent for silence perpetrates violence and we cannot allow that to be. So racism is more than simply a single individual, you or me or somebody else, treating someone badly because of their difference, skin color or whatever. Prejudice, yes. Stereotyping, yes. But racism is much more than that. It's systems and practices and laws and organizations created on the premise that some people are lesser than. Our country was founded on it. Our country's founding documents name it. This sin of racism that we all live with, all of us, affects all of us, and it will not end until white people like me and maybe like you stand and say black lives matter, even though we treat them as if they don't. Until people like you and like I are willing to stand alongside our black siblings and join them in the fight not to lead, but to join with and for, to end racial injustice. Ibram Kendi says to us, there is no such thing as a non-racist. We either are anti-racist or we continue to be part 
of the problem. So I pray that each of us does not become inured to the violence that's perpetrated against our black kin. Curate your news sources. Pay attention to voices you would not normally listen to. Look for the cycles that seek to make the victim, the perpetrator, they're there if you look for them and plain to see. Listen, truly listen to black Americans and believe them. Yeah, believe their experience no matter how different it may be from yours. And ask yourself, whatever it is you recognize, if that was my child, my spouse, my sibling, my parent, my best friend, what would I do about it then? And how would I feel? A word about the destruction and looting that we see happening. Before you rush to judgment, I encourage you to try rushing to understanding instead. To our black siblings and siblings of color, I see you, I hear you, I believe you, and I wish to stand with you and alongside you to the best of my ability for you matter and you deserve justice. Black lives matter. That's important to say, because right now our society does not treat the black community as if they do. Black lives matter, and as a community of faith in a denomination that seeks to be pro-reconciling and anti-racist, the voice of Jesus calls each one of us. So I invite you to consider what it is that you are being called to do. May it be so. Welcome. I am Suzanne Hall Stout. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I am the minister of New Beginnings Christian Church, and it is my honor and my privilege to be the one to welcome you to this time of worship. Today we celebrate Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost is long been recognized as the birth of the church, as the giving of God's holy fire of passion and compassion to the disciples in the earliest of days. And so we gather today to celebrate and to reflect on that. Over these past weeks since Easter, we have spent time reminding ourselves that Christ's spirit lives within us and among us, drawing us as one, that at the heart of the matter together, we are one in God through Jesus Christ, through the spirit that lives within us. So in your home or wherever you find yourself participating in this service together, we have created our own spaces of worship that spans across time and across distance, connecting heart to heart together as one with God's spirit going within us before us and among us. Let us draw ourselves more deeply into worship. I invite us to begin by just paying attention to our breath. With each inhalation, I invite you to receive God's spirit. And as you exhale, release your worries. Receive God's spirit and release your worries. 
receive God's presence and release your hurt. Receive God's love and release your need to control. Receive and release. We have been journeying through this time together with a heart stone or a worry stone. Some have been decorated, some are not. But as we hold our stones, whether in this moment or at other times, it serves as a reminder to us of the closeness of God's touch in our lives, that the weight and feel of the stone remind us that God's arms, God's touch, God's love is with us in so many ways all the time surrounding us, within us, and among us. I invite us to begin with this Pentecost blessing from Jan Richardson. May it call us into worship together. On the day when you are wearing your certainty like a cloak and your sureness goes before you like a shield or a sword, May the sound of God's name spill from your lips as you have never heard it before. May your knowing be undone. May mystery confound your understanding. May the divine rain down in strange syllables yet with an ancient familiarity, a knowing born in the blood, the ear, the tongue, bringing clarity that comes not in stone or in steel, but in fire, in flame. And may there come one searing word, enough to bear you to the bone, enough to set your heart ablaze, enough to make you whole again. And so we pray together. Holy living God, heartbeat of creation, help us to take this time to center on you, for you made us. You gave us life, and you continue to be with us every moment, every breath, every step. Amen. I invite you to join me now in lighting a candle. to remind us that God's presence is with us and between us, that our presence with one another is as well. Amen. Spirit, Spirit of Oh. Uh -huh.
we come now to our time of communion together. If you don't have something to eat and something to drink, I invite you to go get that now. It could be bread or juice. It could be a donut and coffee, whatever you find normal for your table this morning. I invite you to get that to partake together. Today we are blessed to have the Reverend Terry Horde Owens, our denomination's general minister and president, come to offer our invitation to the table, our invitation to partake together. When she is finished, I will offer a prayer of blessing for us and we can partake of the bread and cup together. Disciples, it is always a joy to gather together at the Lord's table. I'm reminded that it's not the frequency with which we gather at this table. It's the access that God has given through Jesus Christ. And through Jesus, we know that all are welcome to this table. We're also reminded of the covenant that God gives through Jesus and it's a covenant that we recommit ourselves to as we gather around the table, the covenant that you and I have as fellow believers in Jesus Christ begins at this table by remembering the covenant that God has made with us. So as we eat and drink today, let us recommit and let us remember that all are welcome. It was on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he sat at the table with his disciples and after giving thanks, he took the bread, blessed it, and broke it and gave it to them saying, take and eat for this is my body broken for you. And in the same way, he took the cup and after he had given thanks, he gave it to them to drink saying, this is the blood of a new covenant with God and God's creation my blood poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. Paul reminds us that as often as we eat of the bread and drink from the cup, we remember the Lord's death and suffering until he shall surely come again. The table of the Lord is now ready. There is room for all and there is enough for all. May we eat and drink in remembrance of the one who loved us so. Amen. Will you pray with me, please? Wind and fire of God, we gather in your name, invited by Jesus, bound together with your spirit in union with each other. Feed our bodies and our spirits with your comforting presence so that we might be your comfort to others, with your challenging presence so that we might be challenged ourselves. Bless this food and break open our hearts Bless this drink and pour out your love. In Christ we pray, amen. The bread of Christ, take and eat. The cup of the new covenant, take and drink. Amen.
Sundays leading up to Pentecost, we've heard Jesus tell his disciples that God's Holy Spirit would come to them after he was gone, come to them to fill them with God's passion and God's compassion. Today, I invite you to listen as the story is shared from the second chapter of the book of Acts, the story of Jesus' disciples being filled with the promise of God, the story that we recognize as the birth of the movement of followers in the way of Jesus. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were gathered together all in one place, and suddenly a sound came from heaven like the rush of a mighty wind. It filled the, it filled the house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them tongues of fire resting on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other languages. Now there were in Jerusalem devout Jews from every nation under heaven. And at this sound they came together, and were bewildered because they heard speaking in their own languages. Are not all these people Galileans? How is it that we hear each in our native tongue? We hear from every nation, yet in our own language, the mighty works of God. What does this mean? Some mockingly said, they are drunk with new wine. But Peter said, listen to me. These people are not drunk. We witness Jesus being raised from the dead, being exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from God the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this which you see and hear. This is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. And that day about 3,000 were baptized, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. At Pentecost, we celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit and what some call the birthday of the church. Let's think about the context of those early followers in the weeks after the resurrection. The Holy Spirit came in the midst of disruption and uncertainty. Even though Jesus appeared to some of his followers in those 40 days after he had risen and told them he had to leave them, reminded them that he would send a comforter, a helper, and told them that they would receive power to do what he had taught, their anxiety levels must have been off the charts. The political environment was such that they would not have been safe to publicly associate themselves with the Jesus movement, and they were certainly not free to gather as a community. But in the midst of that uncertainty, the Holy Spirit came to give them comfort and strength, just as Jesus had promised. In the midst of this pandemic, a time of great disruption and uncertainty, I have seen the Holy Spirit show up for us as a church to comfort and give us peace, to remind us that God is with us, and to strengthen us so that we can continue to live out our calling as the Church of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit also shifted perspectives. Many of these followers had heard Jesus teach, had followed him around, thought they understood who he was, but the power of his message did not become real until the Holy Spirit came. Peter, that hot-head disciple, the one who publicly declared his loyalty and then publicly denied Jesus, became a powerful preacher articulating the gospel in ways that caused 3,000 people to come forward to join that community that day. And the Spirit shifted their understanding of themselves as community. They began to gather in homes to share the Lord's meal. They comforted and encouraged one another, but they also taught one another what Jesus had taught them, and they took care of one another. 
They shared what they had so that everyone would have enough. They had the courage to imagine a world where everyone had enough, a world where all were welcome. The Holy Spirit also equipped them. Whatever you think of what happened in that upper room, for me, the miracle is not just that people were able to speak languages that they previously did not know, but that everyone heard the message of the gospel in their own language. The languages were tools to reach the people. We must allow the Holy Spirit to equip us with new tools, new ways of being church, new methods. We must listen to new stories and hear new voices. On this Pentecost Sunday, we are in the midst of great disruption. And I pray that we will be more sensitive than ever to the presence and leading of the Holy Spirit. In Isaiah 11, the prophet says that the Spirit of the Lord will be upon the Messiah. And the peaceful kingdom that we all read about is not even possible unless the Spirit of the Lord is present. Without the Spirit, we have no movement for wholeness in a fragmented world. But with the Spirit, we can move through times of uncertainty and disruption with courage and strength. With the Spirit, our perspectives can shift so that we can imagine big things for God. We can imagine a world where all have enough and we will have the courage to work for it, to ensure that there is room at the table for all and that the dignity of God's creation is respected by all. With the Spirit, we can move forward and emerge with fresh fire as a new church, ready to serve and show up in a new world. May it be so. before about how we're each different, right? We're not the same. Our skin color might be different. Our hair color might be different. I mean, those are obvious and easy ways to tell differences, but we're different in a lot of ways and God created us that way. One of the ways we're different is how we see things, what we notice. 
So if we were looking at a picture together, I might first notice the blue sky in the picture, and you might notice the pretty pink flowers or the duck swimming on the lake. We don't see everything the same way, and that's not bad. That's a good thing. We also don't all see the same thing about God the same way. So when I think of God, when I picture God, I may picture love, that that's what I see when I think of God. But you may picture forgiveness. You may picture strength. You may picture justice and equity, and hear God call us to do the same. So it's beautiful that we are different and that we see different pieces and parts of God because when we put all our pieces together, we get a beautiful, beautiful image. You know, if we all saw God the same way I do, well, the picture would be okay. But we would be missing so much about God. We need each other, and we need what each other sees. God created us to be different, and that's something to celebrate and not be afraid of. So we learn together to listen to one another, to value each other's experiences, so that I might understand God better because of you. Amen. This week we add to our prayer wall prayers for Don and Dan and Roz and any others for healing and for strength. Prayers for our nation as we recognize anew the cost that this coronavirus is taking. Over 100,000 people have died. Countless more have compromised health. The trauma, the stress, especially to our medical community, first responders, and personal care providers. Prayers for our black siblings and other persons of color. May they not be alone in the fight to end racism, inequality, and injustice in our nation. May those of us who are white hear and see the reality of racial injustice, and may we work first to end our own actions our conscious and unconscious acts of supremacy that support racial inequity. And our church, may we step up and step out, taking conscious steps along the path to become an anti-racist community in all the ways that we can. I invite you, as we have been doing, to write down your joys and your concerns to share them with me if you wish, to write them down or say them out loud, to hold them into your heart. Joys and concerns shared and offered, I believe help lessen our pain and amplify our joy. We'll enter into a brief time of musical meditation. I invite you to bring your joys and concerns into your heart and to perhaps to write them as well.
Will you join me in prayer? Holy Spirit, wind of God, on this day of Pentecost we are gathered together while physically apart. We are both full of flaming fire and quietly burning embers. We are courageous and tentative. We are gifted by dreams and haunted by worries. In all ways, this holy of days finds us to be still fully human. Will you fill us up? Will you awe our hearts so that we too might understand your word and your work of power in the world? Will you declare the assurance that our souls long to hear? The peace that all your children need, the renewal that is hope's creation. Let it be so. And may we who aspire to be fire become at least your kindling in this world that needs your love. Let it be so. And may we who dream of flying be willing to bend in your breeze like flowers dancing their praises in a world that desperately needs whimsy. We ask in wonder. We pray in astonishment. We wait for heaven to come among us like a rush of roaring wind and like a flame that ignites without ceasing. Let us work for justice and peace among all your people in the way of the prayer of Jesus that we pray together. Our creator in heaven, hallowed is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now I invite you to breathe in God's healing spirit and breathe out God's restoring peace. As we do so, we recognize the breath of God that is the spirit of compassion and presence, the breath of God that blows outward from us into the world.
that our faith calls us to serve one another in love as much as we can in all times and in all places that we can. One way I believe we do this is by recognizing the places and the ways in our lives that we glimpse the love of God being shared. Those moments for which we can give gratitude even in the midst of pain. A few weeks ago, I invited you to begin the daily practice of writing down at least one thing each day that you found yourself being grateful for and putting that in a blessing bowl or jar or some place to collect it every day. Today, I invite you to go through that stack of blessings, whether it's one or many. Remind yourself of the many ways in which you glimpsed God at work, of the many ways in which you glimpsed ways to be grateful for what is happening within us and among us and around us. What is it that you've been grateful for these past weeks? Where have you glimpsed God? I invite you not to stop this gratitude practice today, but let it become a daily habit, even if it's a mental exercise and not a written one specifically and intentionally pause to remember the things that you are grateful for, the places you glimpsed God today. And now as we close our time of worship together, may you carry this blessing with you into whatever the week holds for you and for our world. May the breath of God fill you May the love of God guide you. May the Spirit of God hold you close all the days ahead. Amen. Thank you.